Lex orandi, lex credendi, whose law, whose belief? By Sister Mary Augustine O.P. Right now, a great deal of the conflict in the Church centres on the sacred liturgy, in specifics, on the Mass. Even the divisions over morality often occur down what turns out to be liturgical lines, conservative or traditionalist versus liberal. No doubt this is due to the fact that the Mass is the source and summit, the theological core of our Christian faith and life, so that as the Mass goes, so goes the faith, and vice versa. The clashes that have developed around the Mass tend to fall into four rather obvious categories, and it is probably helpful, whatever side of the argument you favour, to give some thought to these and to the questions of truth and validity that emerge. One thing is clear as you look even cursorily at the Church documents that underlie this issue that is dividing Catholics from Catholics, in some respects even more markedly than what pits Catholics against the world in general. It is that prejudice and factual imprecision tend to rule the debate. The ironic result of this is that people who should be standing up for the same thing are taking up arms against each other in sometimes vicious combat. The differences tend to revolve around the theological, cultural, liturgical and spiritual understandings of the Mass. The Church's Theology of the Liturgy One would get the impression from some of the more traditionalist writings and commentaries that the Vatican II liturgy is not only a different kind of animal from the Tridentine, but that it is based on false or at least dangerous theological concepts. Is this because these people don't read the actual church documents, even the Catechism, issued at and since Vatican II, preferring instead to rely on their own experience of and reports on abuses carried out in the name of the Council. Take a look, for example, at these two excerpts. One is from the Roman Catechism of Trent, 1556, Part 1, Chapter 4, and the other from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, Paragraph 1367, both of which contain definitions of the Mass. Quote from Trent. We therefore confess that the sacrifice of the Mass is and ought to be considered one and the same sacrifice as that of the cross. For the victim is one and the same, namely Christ our Lord, who offered himself once only, a bloody sacrifice on the altar of the cross. The bloody and unbloody victim are not two, but one victim only, whose sacrifice is daily renewed in the Eucharist, in obedience to the command of our Lord. End quote. From the Catechism of the Catholic Church, 1367, quote, The sacrifice of Christ and the sacrifice of the Eucharist are one single sacrifice. The victim is one and the same. The same now offers through the ministry of priests, who then offered himself on the cross, only the manner of offering is different. And since in this divine sacrifice, which is celebrated in the Mass, the same Christ who offered himself in a bloody manner on the altar of the cross is contained and offered in an unbloodied manner. This sacrifice is truly propitiatory. End quote. It's a pity that people who favour the extraordinary form of the Roman Rite don't at least keep at the back of their minds the Church's actual words in defining the Mass. What do they make of these two almost identical definitions? Have they adverted to them? If so, it is sad that some of them will bypass any celebration of the Novus Ordo, ordinary form Mass, on the grounds that it is at least slightly invalid can anything be slightly invalid, or at best, tacky and inferior. What we all need to use as our criteria in judging any celebration of Mass 
are the following bottom line facts about it, regardless of where it is said, who says it, and in what style it is celebrated. Point 1. The Mass is the representation of Christ's sacrifice on Calvary. Point 2. Christ is the victim offered. Christ is the priest offering. The priest is his minister. Point 3. The whole Christ is there at every Mass, the divine head in union with his mystical body. Point 4. The entire Church, earthly, heavenly, and purgatorial, is there at every celebration of the Mass. Point 5. We offer the sacrifice with the priests, as Christ's priestly people, baptized members of his mystical body. Point 6. For a Mass to be valid, all that is required is the matter, wheaten bread and grape wine, and the words of consecration by an ordained priest who has the intention of consecrating. Many Catholics may not advert to these facts, may not have ever had them explained to them, or may have been diverted away from them by modernist priests and their trendy adherents, but that does not alter their truth. The Mass as Cultural Experience Theological conflicts about liturgy are one thing, and a very central thing at that. But theology often becomes tangled up with people's cultural expectations. The people who prefer modern mass celebrations to traditional ones, or vice versa, often use theological reasons that are really based on aesthetics and cultural preferences. Granted, there are problems on both sides. It is very hard to pray the mass, or to perceive what stupendous things are happening on the altar either when your senses are being overstimulated by distracting liturgical stunts or unfitting commentaries in some badly celebrated Novus Ordo Mass, or, conversely, understimulated by extended silences, invisible action and an unfamiliar language throughout the Mass in the extraordinary form. You will hear people waxing eloquent about either form, usually while putting down the other. Devotees of the old form speak lovingly about the mass of the ages and deplore the ruptures and innovations caused by the new form. This is a view that does not have history on its side. Culturally, the Church has been through various styles of rendering the mass over the centuries. The extraordinary form which people lovingly attend today is not ascetically like the mass of the early Church or probably of any given phase of the Church's history. Prior to the Council of Trent, various rites and usages abounded, so that the Council required that they all be scrapped in favour of the Roman rite, except for those that had been in use for 200 years or more. One of those ancient rites or usages was the Dominican rite, which did and still does trendy things like preparing the bread and wine before Mass, and omitting most of the prayers at the foot of the altar. Then there is the issue of styles. The 17th century Baroque form of worship, for example, consciously departed from medieval settings and conventions in favour of bright, elaborate church decor and the liturgical style that aped the lavish court ceremonial of the time, with music akin to that of the concert hall. Pope Leo, in the late 19th century, had to instruct the Congregation for Rites to publish a decree banning the liturgical use of operatic and dance music, erotic popular songs and romances, as well as the use of profane instruments, tambourines, drums, pianos, etc. Shades of what was to come. Then there were the low-key cultural phases. People who were around in the 1940s and 50s scarcely knew what a high mass was. Low mass without music seemed to be the order of the day in most parishes 
until the late fifties, when instructions came from the Congregation for Rites to encourage the singing of hymns and recitation of prayers in the vernacular by the congregation, anything, it seems, to mobilise them into participation. Thomas Day, in his insightful and often humorous book, Why Catholics Can't Sing, explains how this bland approach to liturgy in America derived from the Irish Catholics, who had endured centuries of religious persecution, where the celebration of Mass, if it was attempted at all, had become a skeletal, clandestine affair. They and their descendants not only didn't look for pomp and ceremony such as music at Mass, but saw it as somehow Protestant, or just plain unnecessary. There is a strange irony in the fact that people often deplore the loss of certain little cultural touches that had been introduced into the Mass over the centuries, forgetting that they were just that, little touches, and were once that dreaded thing, an innovation. Sometimes these are referred to disparagingly as accretions, although some of them have merited to become built into the liturgy and are now often defended as fundamental. So the argument that the Mass as a cultural experience has been unchanging until Vatican II is unfounded. Most liturgical historians admit that we don't even know for the most part what shape the Mass took during whole centuries of the Church's early existence. The Mass as Liturgy So much for the cultural side of things. The idea of the Mass as Liturgy is an important element in the arguments between the adherents of new and old forms of Mass. It involves the language, structure and rubrics of the Mass. Language the argument is mostly about Latin in the Mass. What most people don't know, or don't take into account, is that the Roman Rite is a Latin Rite, that Latin is the official and traditional language of the Roman Rite, whether in the old, extraordinary form, or the new. The use of the vernacular languages is an issue that has been around since ordinary people stopped speaking Latin, which is centuries ago. But the Church has hung on to Latin. Vatican II affirmed that Latin was to be retained as the language of the Roman Church and that at the liturgy the people should be able to respond and sing the parts applying to them in Latin. It also said that the vernacular was useful for those parts of the Mass where people's understanding of the text was crucial, the readings and the prayers. The only difference between Trent's treatment of the vernacular in the liturgy and that of Vatican II is that Trent anathemized anyone who shall say that the Mass ought to be celebrated in the vernacular tongue only. The bishops at that council were mostly in favour of the use of the vernacular for the readings at least, but it seemed expedient to them, in the light of the Protestant Revolution, to hold off on that concession. It is a burning shame that countries like France, Germany and Belgium, who had introduced the vernacular into their liturgies before Vatican II, became the self-appointed trendsetters at and after the Council. And it is to the shame of our hierarchy in Rome and elsewhere in the world that they allowed this influence to hold sway so that Latin came to be seen as almost anathema in the new order of Mass. It is interesting to think about how many less disaffected Novus Ordo Mass goers would have had if the Mass in this form had been offered in Latin on a wider scale from the outset, as Vatican II implied it should. Structure This is also an important issue in the struggle between old and new forms of Mass. It seems to be more about unchanging stability then about validity, although people often seem to confuse the two. The Novus Ordo Mass is valid. The old form of Mass is valid. The structural difference is that the new form offers more flexibility 
and a limited variety of options for different situations and needs. The old form, practically none. Unfortunately, the pushing of liturgical boundaries by liturgists, priests and bishops over more than 50 years has horribly distorted the way the Novus Ordo has come to be judged by friends and foes alike. It is unfair to condemn the Novus Ordo based on the many poor, unfaithful celebrations carried out in this form. Fortunately, there are priests who know their liturgy and what the Church says it should be. Their Novus Ordo celebrations are a liturgical delight and an experience in Catholic authenticity. If this type of celebration had reigned after Vatican II, there might have been less reason for people to escape to the extraordinary form. Catholic authenticity when it comes to liturgy, especially the Mass, requires that everyone is engaged. The Church has been for more than a hundred years under a series of popes pushing for maximum active participation at Mass by the people. This is based on the theological reality that the Mass is an action by the whole Church and that we must never be mere spectators at Mass, let alone physically present clods with minds and hearts elsewhere. The new order of Mass requires more prayers, responses, gestures and ideally singing by the congregation. It allows for the people to hear the Word of God, the prayers and the blessings in their own language, even if the rest of the Mass is said in Latin. It allows them to sing the traditional music of the church, Gregorian chant, along with some of its beautiful traditional hymns in the vernacular. The Old Mass is far more circumscribed. It only allows for a few variations on the type of Mass, Low Mass, the Individual Mass, Missa Solitaria, Missa Cantata, Solemn High Mass, etc., without much crossing of rubrical lines between them. There is a real danger for congregations at the extraordinary form of Mass to be there without following or understanding what is going on in the sanctuary, without verbal responses or congregational singing unless they are well instructed and are equipped with missiles. The Council of Trent treated low Mass as the standard form. This is probably why, by the 19th century, it was not unusual to find parishes where the Mass was never sung, but had become a private Mass at which a congregation was present but played no active role. It also explains why, by the 20th century, people had begun to engage in popular devotions during Mass virtually in competition with the sacred liturgy. Rubrics There are plenty of fights about these, even within traditional ranks. But if we knew of some of the bizarre sets of rubrics that have graced the Mass over the centuries, we might be less concerned about whether this or that rubric is important, or even rooted in tradition. Dom Cassian Folsom, in an interesting paper delivered at the July 2001 Fontgombeau Liturgical Conference, describes some 8th and 9th century offertory rubrics. Tradition-minded Catholics who are critical of the scaled-down offertory prayers in the New Mass might find the opposite problem with an offertory ritual that involved 14 ministers of varying degrees from the Pope down Offerings collected one after the other from various sectors of the congregation, nobles, commoners, men and women, and an incredible multiplicity of passings and preparations of gifts. The whole thing must have taken an immense amount of time, and had it not been fine-tuned in the intervening centuries, would likely induce acute indigestion in even the most voracious of modern rubricians. It is interesting that there appeared to be few prayers and gestures recorded in the text from which he cites. One interesting fact which has not come to the attention of many Catholics from either end of the liturgical spectrum is that provision was made as early as the Council of Trent for commentators to be used 
in order to make the Mass intelligible to the people. There is a clear understanding that these can and should be used in the text of a pre-Vatican II document coming from the Congregation for Rights in 1958. Nowadays, a commentator at any Novus Ordo Mass would be the sign of a trendy celebration, mainly because he or she is superfluous, and probably only there to maximise so-called participation by the laity. The moral of all this is that the rubrics of the Church's liturgy are not static, and while the essentials do not and cannot change, there have in fact been adaptations according to the times and to their needs. We should not be wrangling over the forms presently available to us in the Church today, as if one is or should be extinct, and the other has or should have undergone total destruction, as if one is valid, the other invalid, as if one is attractive, the other agonizingly distasteful. The Spiritual Stakes Objectively, the Mass in any valid rite or form, and in any age, has the same power to sanctify. Of course, the Mass is the sacrifice of Christ applied to us and to the whole Church. The spiritual fruits of the Mass are four, general to the whole Church, special to those who are present at it, ministerial for those for whom the priest offers the Mass, personal to the priest himself. The thing to remember is that the amount of grace coming from a Mass depends on the dispositions of those who receive them. There is a lesson in this for those who think Holy Communion should be given to those engaged in grave public sin. If the disposition of the participants is so key to the distribution of grace coming from the Mass, the central source of all grace, because it is the sacrament of Christ himself, then the awareness of those participants, their understanding of what is going on at Mass, is vital. The Church, knowing this, has been at pains for hundreds of years to make the Mass accessible to people's minds and thereby to their hearts. This involves not just teaching the people of God about the Mass, but teaching them how to immerse themselves in it, how to be an active part of it materially and spiritually. The Council of Trent tried. The liturgical movements from the late 19th century tried. The Popes of Recent History tried. The Congregation for Rights tried. You can't count the exhortations that have come down to us from the official church instructing pastors to teach the liturgy and to instruct people in their active and intentional role in it. The document on the sacred liturgy of Vatican II, Sacrosanctum Concilium, is a crowning effort. Yet the general picture has been one of failure. Perhaps because of the poor liturgical formation of priests between Trent and the 1950s, which approached the liturgy in a rationalistic, rubricist spirit, merely as the official form for the external worship of the Church, the education of the faithful in just what the Mass is took a back seat. Before Vatican II, it seems that many people went to Mass without having a real idea of what it was. If they had, they never would have spent their time at the sacred liturgy saying their rosaries or reading from their favourite prayer books. Unfortunately, all that most Vatican II clergy seemed to do was to try to make the Mass seem relevant to the tastes and mentality of the people instead of lifting the people's minds to its lofty truths. True liturgical education in most places still does not happen. Even today, one suspects that those who attend the extraordinary form of the Mass are not particularly au fait with what is really going on. Many seem to be satisfied to be spectators, happy for the priest and maybe the choir to engage in all the action. There is a mentality you hear voiced from time to time, suggesting that the great thing in the old form is to let the whole thing wash over you and bask either in the silence or in the elevating music if it's on offer. 
This seems to suggest more of a cultural and emotional fix than a spiritual one. It does not reflect the mind of the church in relation to her official worship. It may not even garner all the graces on offer to those who are properly disposed, unless, of course, the people concerned are ignorant of church teaching and her exhortations on the subject. Then it is their pastors who may have to answer for the deficiency. <laughs>